Okay, um, here we are. And I'm just uh, chat. Okay. Welcome everyone, I'm Ida Corley, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a lecturer in English here at Maynooth with expertise in post-colonial writing, especially Black and African writing. With Lawrence Cox and Helen Fallon, I co-edited Silence Would Be Treason, a volume of letters and poems written by Ken Sarawiwa from his final detention to Irish nun and solidarity worker, Sister Magella McCarran, which has become the subject of a BBC World Service radio documentary, and we'll be talking to the producer shortly. My co-convener, Anne O'Brien, is Associate Professor of Media Studies. Her main research focus is on gender inequality in media work. Anne was instrumental in creating the Ken Sarawiwa audio archive with Maynooth University Library, featuring interviews with Owens Wiwa, No Sarawiwa, and Sister Magella McCarran. And there's some useful links in the chat for you to explore, including a link to the, the library um, or archive. Um, we, we are delighted to host you this afternoon, and I'd like to extend a very special welcome to our panelists, Anulika Agina, Barbara Flood, and Jennifer Wenzel, whom I'll introduce in more detail shortly. And thank you to the panelists for generously sharing your time with us today. There are over 50 people in the virtual room from Ireland and the UK, Nigeria, Canada, and the United States. And those of you in the audience are in listener only mode. So this means that we can't bring you on screen or hear you, but the chat facility is open for comments and questions. So do type your questions and comments as they arise, and we will try to get to them by the end of the seminar. This is the 10th annual Ken Sarawiwa seminar at Maynooth University. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Ken Sarawiwa, he was an award-winning writer, television producer, and environmental activist who was brutally executed by the Nigerian military regime in 1995 for organizing a peaceful and democratic campaign for environmental justice in the oil ravaged region of the Niger Delta. He has been described by Rob Nixon, author of the groundbreaking text, Slow Violence, as the first African writer to articulate the literature of commitment in expressly environmental terms. A member of the historically marginalized Ogoni community, he is credited with having compared and combined the movement for environmental justice in Ogoni with other global South movements for rights. And through an organization known as UNPO, the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization in The Hague, with linking these global South movements up with what was largely at the time a Western and sometimes elitist environmental movement. So Sarawiwa's work paved the way for global environmental and climate action, and his bravery and sacrifice also raised awareness globally of the need for corporate social accountability. So each year since Sister Magella's donation, we run a seminar to commemorate Ken Sarawiwa and to renew his life goals. The theme of our seminar this year is reimagining the Niger Delta in audiovisual media, and I feel extremely privileged to be introducing our guests this afternoon. We have a really wonderful lineup. Each panelist has made a distinctive and important contribution to her field, and each brings a different perspective to bear on the issues. So we can expect a very stimulating and engaging conversation. Dr. Anulika Agina is an Associate Professor of Media and Culture at the Pan-Atlantic University Lagos, with a focus on Nigerian film and cinema going cultures. She has examined the representation of Nigeria's Niger Delta in film and its reception among stakeholders. Funded by the European Research Council in 2019, she joined the Screen Worlds project at SOAS University of London to investigate Nigerian screen cultures, which led to the production of a documentary on film exhibition titled Behind My Nollywood Screen, released this year, and a forthcoming co-edited book on contemporary African screen worlds by Duke University Press. Her work has been published in Black Camera, Critical African Studies, Journal of African Cultural Studies, and other reputable journals. Barbara Flood is a freelance writer and journalist living in Ireland who has produced radio documentaries for the BBC World Service, News Talk, and community radio stations. Her podcasts include Wander, an Irish Arts Council funded series 
with writers living in refugee camps in Greece, Jordan, Bangladesh and Malawi. She has a special interest in migration, the stories of people seeking refuge and how journalists can work together to challenge some of the current narratives around migration and the global refugee crisis. Her recent radio documentary based on the letters and poems in Silence Would Be Treason aired on BBC World Service last January. Professor Jennifer Wenzel is a scholar of postcolonial studies and energy and environmental humanities at Columbia University. Her 2006 essay, Petromagic Realism Toward a po Political Ecology of Nigerian Literature, helped pioneer the study of literature and oil. With Imra Zeman and Patricia Yeager, she co-edited Fueling Culture, 100 Words for Energy and Environment, published by Fordham University Press in 2017. Her most recent monograph, The Disposition of Nature, Environmental Crisis and World Literature, also published by Fordham in 2019, has been described as a foundational text for the environmental humanities. She's a member of the Petrocultures Research Group and the After Oil Collective. So welcome to all three panelists. It's a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. And Jennifer, I might turn to you first and ask you, you we've just used these terms, petroculture and the After Oil Collective. Could you please explain the term petroculture to listeners who may not know what that word means? Sure, absolutely. I I, I, uh, I understand the idea of listeners who don't know what it means, but I think when I start to talk about it, uh, the, the thing about petroculture is, is people tend to say, oh yes, <laughs> I know exactly what that means. So uh, simply put, petroculture uh, means how fossil fuels and particularly oil intersect with and shape the culture, whether culture in a sociological sense or an aesthetic sense. And petroculture is a concept uh, that was formulated by the petrocultures research group at the University of Alberta in Canada. So it's shaped by the local situation of that institution located near the oil sands of Northern Alberta. And so this notion of petroculture emerges out of proximity to this uh, major and controversial site of extraction in Canada. So we could think of it in the narrow sense of naming uh, modes of living uh, that grow up around a, a boom town. Um, but I think that the, the term has a much broader significance, and I can say that as a U.S. citizen and a sometime uh, Texan, that U.S. Uh, culture is petroculture uh, par excellence. Um, petroculture is at the heart of what it is to be a, a American, right, a kind of unexamined uh, relationship to an intimacy with fossil fuels. And so, you know, how exactly does oil shape culture? Um, I would say in the North American version, um, it involves uh, cheap and easy access to seemingly limitless energy um, and how that shapes the built environment, political systems, the economy, but also how fossil fuels become associated with ideas of progress, modernity, freedom, autonomy, um, pleasure. Um, when I wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, um, how does oil silently shape uh, my ideas about what I might do, uh, the trajectory that my life might uh, take? And I think that this the shaping of oil is at work in the realm of ideology and cultural imaginaries, embodied experience, but also in material terms. So I said earlier that the built environment, um, which in the US is premised upon gasoline powered automobility, the economy, how oil shapes the distribution of wealth and power, how oil money shapes institutions like legislatures and universities. Um, but I also I think petrocultures is about the kind of materiality that you hold in your hand. Um, so how books, uh, film aren't just created out of thin air, but are themselves made of and by fossil fuels, uh, whether petrochemical feedstock or the energy on which these uh, industries depend. And so I, I think the obvious question for our seminar today is, is what does petroculture look like in Nigeria? Um, and uh, just as, as one kind of powerful example, um, the sociologist uh, Wendy Griswold has tracked uh, in, in a graph um, and shown how um, Nigeria's oil boom in the 1970s and 80s is, is kind of mirrored very closely by Nigeria's novel boom 
of the 70s and 80s, um, which put Nigerian literature on the map, right? So it's a really powerful example of petroculture. And, and so I think, you know, one question that, that you know, we can talk about together is what is the relationship between Nigeria writ large um, and extraction in the Niger Delta? And uh, how does Nigeria's important role in the global oil industry shape petroculture as, ex as it's experienced in Nigeria? And how does it enable petrocultures elsewhere? So that's, that's kind of the, the range of things that I think are, are named by this term. That's great. And, and um, so, so those questions are really useful ones for us to have. Thank you for those, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, and you also use the term petro magic. So you're talking about the silence of um, the, the silent shaping of our lives by oil. Can you, can you maybe just say briefly what petro magic is? Yeah. So I, I, I think I, I think of petro magic in, in two um two kind of diametrically opposed ways, right? And, and petromagic is, is actually an idea from uh, Fernando Cornel and Michael Watts, the social scientists that talk about the kind of petromagic in one sense as, as the fairy tale promise of oil. Um, in, a, in, in the realm of political economy, the, the idea of, you know, wealth without work, that, um, that the discovery and, um, and development of oil extraction will transform an economy overnight. That's one version of, of Petromagic, which is often turns out to be a, a fairy tale, right? It, it promises things that it doesn't, um, uh, the things that don't come true or, or don't stay true. But I think when, when you picked up on that idea of the way that oil silently shapes our lives, Another um, version of Petromagic that I've been thinking of more recently is, um, it, it is a kind of real life magic. <laughs> and what I mean by that is the, the kind of stupendous powers that fossil fuels actually put at our fingertips. Um, it, 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 maybe example one is the fact that we're all sitting in different time zones <laughs> with an audience that we cannot see, literally. Um, and we, at this point in the Zoom era, we just take these things for granted. Um, uh, even before the, the Zoom era, we, we just take, a, a, or, or let me revise that. Those who have, um, uh, you know, access, you know, uh, unproblematic access to energy energy, right? Reliable access to energy. Take these things for granted. And so what I'm trying to think about with that version of Petromagic is a kind of disenchantment where we don't recognize and grapple with and confront um, uh, the, the, the powers that we actually have. And given the context of this conference, the cost that other people pay for that magic, right? Yeah, yeah. And um and you have some questions from Barbara because she has helped to highlight the costs that, that Jennifer is referring to. Absolutely. Um, Barbara, I think you did a fantastic job in the documentary of corralling such a kind of potentially unwieldy story. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what caught your imagination when you first kind of came across Ken Sarawiba's uh, relationship with Magella and what you felt lay at the heart of that and how you went about telling that story? Yeah, um, I think I just, you know, he, he's a very charismatic person that comes across in the letters. Um, but I was really struck, though, how he kept trying to downplay that. So he kept talking about the movement in terms of the other people in it, like he highlighted the women's movement. So he, he would talk about Lida Mitte, he'd talk about other people. He kept trying to not make himself the focus, even though he knew he had to be the focus in terms of getting funding and getting more allies. And so I was, I just thought he was a very um, inspiring, unique personality. I mean, he could, you know, he could have gone different ways with it, but he was constantly seeking to, to talk to Magella about how everybody else is involved and kind of the, the background to it. And that's the other thing, he wasn't like just philosophizing and, and he, he was really organizing in the letters with Magella, like they were trying to figure out how to, contact different people like you mentioned Unpo earlier the the you know they tried to get him a Nobel Prize through one of the women in Belfast through one of Magella's contacts and it's like I just was struck by that that was this like real actual catalogue of events from behind the scenes that you don't normally get like you know when you get Hollywood films and it's just like it appears like oh like magical kind of uh this guy just did this and that and the other and it's like everybody who who has been involved in any kind of activism knows that it's it's like mundane it's 
it's just a slog and you're dealing with lots of different personalities and you can see that in the letter where he's talking about different personalities not getting on and and um i just thought they were really um really inspiring and and uh uh wise you know and 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 interesting to see behind the scenes of that movement building yeah and is there something in particular about radio documentary, Barbie? You know, people often say that the pictures are better on radio. Was there something about radio that facilitated you telling that story that, as you say, there's a lot of grind and mundanity to that activism work. And yet the radio documentary kind of really captures us and brings us through that story. Like, what is it about radio that you think works so well for telling that story? Mm, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, from... From my point of view, I just find it easier because you it's cheaper. <laughs> you can just get people to it's it's like, you know, when you don't have access to a lot of funding, you can create a whole world just through sound and it's it's much easier just on a practical level. But I think as well, like radio makes you imagine things more maybe than when you see things, it's it's all laid out for you. You don't have to do as much work. Whereas with radio, maybe you have to imagine Ken sitting in in the detention center and you have to imagine th things a bit more um i think as well like i got away with putting in a lot more information in the inserts than i might have had if it was some kind of a visual i don't, I don't know like now i got to put across a lot of uh, information background information what was going on at the time that I, I don't know how that would have worked in a in a thing i still think though that i would love to see i don't know if, if there's ever been a, a film version i mean i still think it, it would be uh, good to do one of his life and of the struggle and and you know if, if anyone wants to make that I think I think it would there's be certainly been <laughs> there's certainly been talk about it all right and um, was there particular challenges then Barbara when it came to you know directly confronting the petro culture the petro giants and in dealing with shell you know like they were almost the silence in the radio documentary in some ways tell us a little bit about what it was like approaching them so um, I obviously had to approach them for a comment and they wanted to talk to me on the phone and I refused. So we just went through emails. That was fine. Um, you know, it was OK. I didn't particularly want to put in the statements from them, but, you know, it was requested of me. Okay. I did wonder <laughs> about that. Yeah, no, it definitely was not my idea. I mean, yeah. I I have a, you know, I'm a journalist. I've been trained as a journalist, but, you know, this thing of being impartial and, and showing two sides, I, I think it's bull, really, like, because, you know, you as a journalist, you decide what your story is, and, and I wasn't impartial, I, you know, and I'm not going to pretend I'm impartial. But anyway, we put in the, the statement, which I read out at the start, and then they wanted another one at the end, so we had to, that delayed production again, so... It, it just delayed things a lot. Um, I think we asked for a statement as well from the Nigerian government, because obviously like, one of the reasons as well to make it is to try and, and have the Agoni 9 exonerated because, you know, that's that's an ongoing campaign that, you know, but we didn't get any response from the Nigerian government. <laughs> yeah, it's still an but, ongoing yeah, yeah, tension yeah. and issue there. Thanks for those I, 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 Yeah, I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but the, it was delayed. The, the, the broadcast was delayed five times then at the last minute each time and I, I don't know what happens but eventually it went through um but I don't okay interesting yeah interesting kind of behind the scenes insight on you know the presence of a company like that and how they impinge very silently into the, the telling of the story and only maybe coming to you as someone who is kind of very steeped in how the Niger Delta shows up on film could you maybe just begin by filling in perhaps the uninitiated, you know, what is Nollywood? It's kind of your area of expertise. Um, how do you, you know, tell us a little bit, Anoli, about Nollywood. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, thanks to the organizers of this wonderful uh, seminar. Uh, thanks to my fellow panelists as well and to the audience. Um, so yes, to begin by talking about Nollywood, Nollywood is the name that um, has been given to the Nigerian film industry in Nigeria, um, largely working in the southern part of Nigeria, that is Southwest, um, and that's Lagos, uh, people who, you know, use the medium of a film to express their deeply held sentiments about their lives and the lives of their loved ones and the social realities um, that we have in Nigeria. Uh, originally, uh, Nollywood started uh, through the Yoruba traveling uh, theater practice, 
um, because that culture was already uh, so deeply ingrained in the people and they started filming their theatrical performances. And then much later, uh, from 1992, uh, the first Nigerian, well, Nollywood era film, because there was also a robust filmmaking practice in Nigeria before 1992. But 1992 is what has come to be celebrated as the birth or the inauguration of Nollywood films. And at that time, the films were practically talking about people's lives, you know, um, wealth creation or the pursuit of wealth against all odds and, you know, similar things that one would find in a Nigerian context, particularly uh, things that relate to the family, you know, and domestic um, kinds of themes. But today, Nollywood has grown significantly and is now telling very many kinds of stories about Africans at large and the kinds of aspirations that they have, and also investigating or probing um, some very disturbing issues like the one we're dis uh, discussing today about um, oil in the Niger Delta region. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Anoli, like in what ways do, does the Niger Delta show up in both in Nollywood and maybe also a little bit in Nigerian documentary? Right. OK, so before 1999, 1999 is the year that Nigeria returned to democracy. Before that year, we had a military government and that was very repressive. And so many filmmakers did not dare to make any films at all that spoke about the government's involvement in uh, the Niger Delta and in the whole business of oil exploration. But when democracy returned to the country, as Jonathan Haynes argued in his work, many filmmakers felt comfortable again to start making films about the Niger Delta, being that it's a very significant, important region in the country. Uh, it, the resources from that area, you know, sort of feed the country, to put it very loosely. And so filmmakers started talking about or filming these areas, filming people's lives as had been affected by uh, the oil exploration activities, the ecological disaster that had happened in those areas and the kinds of responses by the government as well as the oil companies um, at the time. They also filmed uh, the kinds of militancy that arose in the area because of the negligence of the government and because of its um, a very traditional response of not um, giving in to the people's demands. And as you know, uh, there was a lot of corruption in that area, even in the time of Ken Saruwiwa and all the agitations he made while he was alive, trying to seek justice for the people of Ogoni land and environs. Um, so yes, films about Ken Sariwa have actually been made, but with pseudonyms, because uh, you don't want the government coming at you for trying to represent these kinds of images that they wish people would forget. Uh, so it's been very interesting, actually, watching those films. And when I wrote that paper, The Niger Delta and Nigerian Video Films, back in 2013, uh, it was a very emotional period for me because I was watching those films and seeing the kinds of agitations. It was as if the camera and the film directors were telling the stories with a kind of restlessness in their minds, in their spirits, you know, desirous of many people uh, to hear the uh, stories or to watch these images and so that they could create some kind of change. It reminds me very much of Karen Baba's work, the British anthropologist, who said that these popular art forms are ways that um, ordinary people who have been denied access to official channels of communication are actually able to express their own sentiments. And it was beautiful to see how Nollywood filmmakers who had previously been criticized for being apolitical or not responding to the disturbing social issues of a country were actually doing this in very meaningful ways and they were attracting wide audiences. But of course that didn't go uncensored because the government was also there to, you know, um, stymie some of their efforts and to prohibit them from uh, making such films to the extent that when Jetta Ramata um, a filmmaker who's come from a family of filmmakers and theater practitioners made the film titled Black November in 2012, his life was threatened. He had at that time to flee the country with his wife 
because of all the threats he received about making the film. So right now, listening to uh, Barbara talking about someone making a film about cancer, we was live, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think it's a great idea, but I also shudder at it because I don't know which filmmaker will be daring enough to do such a thing. Perhaps it would be someone who, uh, a Nigerian in the diaspora, for example, who would come undercover to do such a thing because you're not going to be allowed to do it. Back in 2008, when um, American uh, documentary filmmaker Sandy Chiofi, I think that I think that's her name, uh, came to make Sweet Crude. Uh, she suffered tremendously at the hands of government in terms of getting permissions, in terms of filming. At some point, I think her camera was confiscated. Uh, eventually, she was able to um, leave the country with the footage that she'd managed to film at the time. Although I got the sense that her project was um, largely uncompleted. But these are mm -hmm. the kinds of tensions that any filmmaker who's trying to tell these stories would face. And so one has to be prepared to navigate those um, situations in order to tell the stories because they are stories that have to be told. Uh, and that's largely because all of the things that Ken Sarabi were laid out in the Ogoni Bill of Rights are yet to be achieved, mm -hmm. right? He's been ignored for so many years. Many like him who are clamoring for environmental justice are still being ignored. No thanks to the corrupt practices of successive governments in Nigeria. And I hate to say this, being that I'm a Nigerian. Um, but it's the stark reality, really, that faces us. And I think that the filmmakers have done an incredible amount of work trying to portray these things. And just before uh, I end this um, first question, the ways that they now try to portray the Niger Delta is by looking at individuals' experiences or individuals' traumatic experiences, because you don't want to point fingers at a government that would come up to you, particularly because these filmmakers have to raise funds for their own films themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to risk losing all of that, all that uh, investment um, in order to make a film that might never even get to be seen. So they strategically overcome this uh, government censorship by looking at people's lives and so on. And you know, leave the government um, action or inaction as the case might be on the margins. And that's what I think the film Oloibiri, which is currently on Netflix, um, has tried to do, you know, looking at uh, the kinds of psychological impact that the oil uh, politics um, have had on people's lives. Okay, so it's an interesting resonance and only there with Barbara around, you know, being forced to make the statement from Shell and yet the silence of the Nigerian government and mm -hmm. how much has actually really moved on since the early, since 1995, which we're commemorating. Um, Ida, I think at this stage you were interested to speak more to Jennifer about kind of petrol cultures around documentary and in documentary. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear that because Jennifer's work has focused on commodity biography, what she calls commodity biography, um, which which are narratives of the life stories of commodities. I'm, I'm quoting from Jennifer now that trace global networks linking mostly third world producers to mostly first world consumers. And um, both Barbara and Anuli have spoken about the difficulties of, of making these stories. But um, Jennifer is also um, concerned about overexposure and the ways in which stories of the Niger Delta of Ken Sarawiwa in particular, and the focus may be perhaps on the on the personalities, because we have these extremes of, you know, of villainy on the one hand and of heroism and uh, sacrifice on the other, can um, hijack the imagination is the term you've used um, Jennifer, and you, you talk about the risks of, of hijacking the imagination, of documentaries hijacking the imagination. Um, and, and you've also meant, you, you've, you've cautioned us that we can no longer assume that seeing is knowing, and that knowing is a catalyst for caring, acknowledging, or acting to rectify suffering or injustice. So I suppose that's very different to when Ken was working with Mossop in the 1990s, and he invited all of these journalists and filmmakers to Ogoni. Um, the British filmmaker Glenn Ellis, of course, made a number of important documentaries, The Heat of the Moment and The Drilling Fields, Delta Force, that 
brought graphic footage of petro violence into the living rooms of viewers in Britain and Ireland. But Jennifer, you've been worried about overexposure now at this point and um, and 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 the hijacking of the imagination leading to acts of unimagining. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. And, and I think actually, you, you know, I, uh, an example that, that I, I have and um, is, is actually about uh, Sandy Choppy's documentary uh, that Analika was, was mentioning um, that uh, she, she did, uh, you know, she did release a version of the film, uh, whether it was the version of the film uh, that she might have wanted to, to make um, without the kind of pressure that, that she faced um, from the Nigerian government, I don't know. But I saw that um, I saw her film *Sweet Crude* in in 2009. I highly recommend it as a as a as a feminist um, account of um, of insurgency in the Niger Delta in the first uh, decade of the 21st century. Um, it's I, I forget now. I think it's a, a Chevron uh, concession that that she's particularly interested in. She was brought in as a documentary filmmaker to to film the opening of a, a community library, and um, and her film took a, a different turn when the community faced um, repression. And so, at a screening of this film that I went to in in New York um, sometime after two thousand nine, there was a man in the audience who. Um, after the film was shown, was just absolutely indignant. Um, and, and he said, uh, why aren't you talking about Shell and Ken Sarawiwa? Um, and it was a moment for me. Uh, in, and so, it, you know, his, his question was coming from a place as if, as if Ken Sarawiwa and Shell were the real story and the only story to tell ever about Nigeria. And um, and, and so, you know, looking at, or you know, listening to, to Barbara's uh, documentary, um, Silence Would Be Treason, and remembering again, this is, you know, me thinking about the ways in which Ken Sarwiwa was able to garner international support in an early, an earlier media landscape. Uh, I assume that the, the man in the audience, like me, probably learned about Ken Sarwiwa's death watching the broadcast nightly news on TV uh, in 1995. And so it's it's just astonishing to think about the ways in which what was happening uh, in Ogoni and Nigeria broke through one version of, of what I have called um, in the disposition of nature, a quarantine of the imagination, right? Where one, uh, a quarantine of the imagination is an inability or failure or refusal to imagine across geographic distance or experiential difference. But what I'm trying to suggest here uh, with this screening of Chaffee's film is that this man was, you know, having kind of broken through one quarantine of the imagination and been, been made to care uh, uh, about um, Ken Sarwiba and, and the Ogoni, he, this man, I think, got stuck in another quarantine of the imagination. And that is that more than 15 years later, he couldn't imagine or think past um, uh, the, the moment of, of Ken Sarwira's death to recognize all of the other things that have happened in the Niger Delta in the wake of his death and the ways in which other ethnic groups and other concessions facing other oil companies have also faced repression. Um, and this is not at all to um, to, to minimize um, the, the the work of, of Ken Sarwira or the outrage of his execution and um, those of his eight um, other colleagues, but instead to think about um, the ways in which, uh, I, to my mind, his uh, Sarwiwa's most powerful legacy, I think, is in building the capacity for movements, whether in Nigeria or uh, globally, um, uh, for change, right? So, so Barbara's kind of emphasized the ways in which Sarawiwa was kind of it's it's not about me, it's about building the movement. And so, um, I've I've actually been been thinking since um, you know since you invited me to to join this panel, um, uh, and even before that, I think about what role can Sarawiwa would play now um, in the fight against climate change um, and in the media uh, landscape that we now inhabit. I mean, how would Ken Sarawiwa tweet? <laughs> I mean, what would he tweet? Um, and so just thinking about the work that he did in the 90s and in, in borrowing from the US environmentalism, uh, UN international, international law discourses of genocide, ecocide, um, 
and the ways in which those ideas have, have kind of engaged with ideas of, of resource control in Nigeria, who benefits uh, from oil extraction, who pays the price. I just imagine a, a Ken Sarwiwa as mobilizing movements now um, to think about what role that Nigeria plays and, and what challenges Nigeria will face in a climate change future. And so, um, so I, I don't want to be heard as saying, like, we need to stop thinking about Sar Sarwiwa. Rather, it's kind of, um, I, I think, to, to most um, uh, honor his his legacy is is to think about the the strategy strategies and tools uh, that that he pioneered in, um, and how that they speak to the challenges that we face now. That is a brilliant answer. Thank you, Jennifer. That those are really great questions for us. Um, just in terms of multinationals. Um, like you recoup the phrase that Sarah we used slick alliance to describe the partnership between Shell and, and the Nigerian military regime. And you, you deploy it again and again in the disposition of nature to talk about how that sort of slippery slick relationship between corporations and uh, repressive states and how corporations are always kind of um, displacing risk and localizing risk in you know um, and displacing also the efforts for example of victims to hold them liable for damages um, and we've we've seen this year uh, the case taken by Esther Kiobel and three other widows of the Agoni Nine um, in The Hague um, was not successful in the sense that they were not successful in um, in suing Shell for damages. Ultimately, the uh, for those of you who, who don't know the case, um, Esther Kiobel uh, tried to pursue Shell for damages because um, witness statements that were used to incriminate her husband um, were later retracted and the witnesses made sworn affidavits stating that they had been bribed to uh, give false witness um, in the trial against her husband. Um, and she was trying to hold Shell to account for this, but um, was not successful. And, and after 20 years, more than 20 years, announced that she was dropping her case. And at the same time, Amnesty International's Mark Dummett released a statement arguing that, that Shell had tried every trick in the book from disputing jurisdictions to refusing to hand over crucial documents to evade a hearing. And he said that the fact that it took more than 20 years for a court to hear Esther's argument was a grim indictment of how corporations are able to evade accountability for terrible crimes and human rights abuses. And, and you've said to us, um, so, so we've been talking about activism, and then there's the legal realm, and then there is the realm of, of the creative industries of media and art. And, um, and you've suggested, Jennifer, that media can be available as a compensatory forum for narrative when the law fails us or fails the, the, um, the, the, the populations that have been victimized. Um, but at the same time, you're you're talking about, you know, and, and the reason media can help is because they can chase and expose corporations and hurt their profits. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Anuli was was asking who would make a film about Ken Sarawiba and what would it look like and mm -hmm. how could it be made? Um, I, I was just noticed on the internet, uh, sorry, the international media database, the IMDB, that there is a, it's a series listed as being in production based on the politics of Bones, which was the Canadian okay. journalist Timothy Hunt's account of Owen's We Was Experience during the crisis, how he had to go into hiding um, when Ken was arrested and, uh, and later after a batch's, uh, after a batch's death. Um, needed to to recover Ken's remains because they were they were not ever returned to the family after the execution, and in some ways the story of the recovery of Ken's remains is the story of his execution because it involves talking to um, witnesses to people who were who, who did could, um, were there for the execution or who were um, there for the burial and so on, um, and I, I guess it's called Black Mangroves and it's being made for Netflix um, and. I, I'm wondering if, you know, on the one hand, we have this, this idea that there can be uh, forms of media work that can be activist. And on the other hand, there is 
something which you described as as predatory spectatorship, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, what do you think? And, and you're particularly concerned about the forms. Um, you, you think the form is something that we really need to think about. Would you would you like to talk to us a little bit about that? Those themes. Well, uh, I mean. Something that um, that leapt to mind as you were just talking about, you know, forms of, of media that are activist and, and forms of media that that are predatory spectatorship. It, it, um, I I saw earlier this fall. Um, I was at a, a at a talk um, by Zina Sarawiwa, uh, one of one of his daughters, and. Um, I think that she, I heard her positioning herself very carefully in relationship to what she called um, uh, competing environmentalisms, right? So that since the since 1990, you know, she she has uh, has shared her life um, with with competing environmentalisms, and and so something that she said really stuck with me. And this may be unique to her, but I think it's a point worth making that um, that. Uh, in in response to um, you know desires or, or pressures that she um, devote herself to to telling the story of, of of suffering and outrage and tragedy in the Niger Delta, she says that I inhabit that tragedy, mm -hmm. um, and I have other kinds of representations and imaginations that I want to make. Right, and so maybe that's the the most urgent example of. of um, uh, of an artist kind of um, trying to hold off that that kind of predatory demand uh, for uh, stories of suffering, um, and that demand uh, tends to come from people who are not directly suffering themselves, right? I think that's the dynamic that that I'm trying to point to um, uh, when you're talking about the um, um, Esther Kiobel's kind of um, uh, dogged efforts to use uh, the law to use um, uh, international legal forums in order to seek justice. Um, it, it reminds me uh, very much of uh, the history of litigation in uh, Bhopal, India, over the the um, gas disaster that happened there in 1984, and has um, has killed and um, and injured um, hundreds and thousands of people in the decades since, and a similar situation uh, where attempts to hold the company Union Carbide and then uh, Dow Chemical, which acquired uh, Union Carbide, to hold those companies responsible, have have kind of repeated run up against the fact that, um, first of all, companies have armies of lawyers whose jobs are to, to find the corners of the law that will keep companies from uh, from being uh, held to account. And also that I, I, I just don't think that the law is made. <laughs> um, and I'm not a legal scholar, so I'll just say very briefly uh, that I, I don't think the law is made uh, for um, for individuals to, to seek um, it, or... It, it, it may be intended, uh, I'm not saying that the law is made only for corporations, but but I think that it is a, certainly a, a David uh, versus Goliath battle. Um, and, and I suppose the, the other thing that I would say um, uh, is something that came to mind um, when Analika was talking about Nollywood. And I'm really struck that she described the rise of Nollywood from 92 to 99 Really, as what we might think about as 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 the decade of um, of uh, Ken Sarawiwa's uh, struggle and the aftermath of his execution, right? And so the, those two things happening at the same time. And what I heard in what she was saying was that um, I, I might put it in slightly different words that. Nollywood um, producers might have been accused uh, in the '90s of escapism. Right. Um, and escapism in the sense of just um, kind of turning away from um, from what was happening in the country to, st to tell domestic stories of individuals. But what I hear her talking about is another kind of escapism, and that is how to escape um, censorship and repression when they have been demonstrated to be deadly serious. Um, and so what but at the same time, I think that we can think of, of, of cultural productions maybe somewhere between uh, activist media and predatory media as, um, as, as forms of representation that, that escape, um, uh, that, that allow for um, uh, people making sense of their lives um, 
and the ways in which their lives are shaped by um, uh, what I might say is, is petrocultures. Um, but sometimes uh, I, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking again about how um, what I hear her saying in some ways is that oil is hiding in plain sight in these documentaries. Oil and the Niger Delta is what they cannot say. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I, I, I am, uh, I am intrigued, um, and, and not suspicious, but, but just intrigued by the idea that it's still impossible, um, to, uh, to, to make a documentary film about the life of Ken Sarawiwa. I think that that talk, that, that suggests the ways that, um, um, that these are very difficult issues, uh, even, uh, even in a democracy. Um, so I've gone on long enough. Thanks so much for the question. Yeah, um, yeah. The the need to confront the silence. I mean, it's making me think about the fact that Adichie <clears throat> disguises uh, Ken Sarawiwa in in purple hibiscus. She uses a, a different name in Wakiti a, a Getchi or something. She uses, um, and also the fact that even her her film about the Biafran War was censored initially, right? And some pieces of it needed to be removed. Anuli, do you have any responses to Jennifer's comments there? Mm -hmm. Barbara? Yes, um, I do. Know, have... Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I know. Are you sure? Um, yeah, I just, I just find it really interesting that the, the, but the, what did you call it? The predatory uh, spectatorship. What's, what was the phrase? Sorry, yeah. Jennifer. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. That's, it's something that I always have to keep in mind, you know, when you're, especially when you're a journalist and you like, oh, it's a big juicy story and you just have to really like, be clear on why you're making a particular story and who you want to platform and what's the what's the end result like is it just to entertain people or like to make them feel sad like some people said they felt very sad after listening to the documentary and I was like okay grand but like um can you write can you also write to the Nigerian government and like maybe suggest that they're exonerated and I suppose that maybe was something that there was no call to action in the in the documentary which is another thing that as you know you're kind of limited in what you can ask the listener to do it's up to the listener to try and do that and it's just like you're you're trying to always um shake people up a bit and and show them something but also not just oh this is a story about a man who lived 20 30 years ago and this is what happened to him but this is something that's ongoing that's always happening that's happening people all around the world even now and and it's not like yeah he was a special man but we're all we all can organize we all can be activists we can all help our communities and I don't know it's really hard to I don't want my stories to be like um just this interesting tale and, and just forget about it and go on and like well what am I having for dinner like it's like no like this should really make you think and this should make you change things and like how are we going to transition from petrol like how are we going to do this it's it's a huge question and yeah sorry it's an interesting point I think there as well Barbara around kind of how we're thinking about media here as just media producers who are either sort of you know villains or heroes but there's a whole kind of shift in the media, media ecosystem as well that now allows people to very directly engage with some of these companies, some of these perpetrators, you know, in terms of social media, you know, Twitter, TikTok. Have you any sense, and it would equally be a question for Anoli, around responses to mediations of these stories that have actually kind of taken on that activist mantle, as well as just the sort of emotive, passive, oh, that's a really sad story. Noli, do you want to do that? Or, yeah. Sure. Yes, yeah. thank you. So I will start with this last question about responses to the stories. When Jeter Amata made his um, film, Black November, in 2012, uh, that film wasn't seen by very many Nigerians because of the threats that um, were issued to him at the time. But the few elite Nigerians who saw it um, decided to do something about it. And what they did was to sponsor education, the education of some people from a Niger Delta as a way of responding to their plight. Now, one might say that that is a one-off kind of intervention where in actual fact, what we need is something that's more sustainable, right? And individuals may not be able to clean up uh, 
the environmental uh, disaster in the Niger Delta, because as the uh, United Nations, one of the United Nations report um, indicated, that oil spillage or the oil spillage of so many years will take at least 30 years uh, to clean up, if at all we do it. And we haven't seen any kind of um, serious political will on the part of a government to actually begin that cleanup. So um, individuals living here at home and abroad have tried to do something about it, but there's only so much um, one individual or an NGO, for example, can do um, about these kinds of things, which is why um, I like to suggest, you know, that we continue to talk about these things so that more people can get on board because there's been public distrust and growing public distrust uh, among Nigerians and the government because of all that have happened um, over the years. Uh, and the question that Barbara raised is very important on who is the audience. I think that that's something that we always have to think about, especially the filmmakers who come from the West to film in Nigeria. Um, and this is where I would like to evoke um, one of my uh, popular, I don't want to call it a mantra, but something that sits uh, firmly in my head these days because of my work and the work I did at SOAS is decolonizing um, well, decolonizing our screens, decolonizing the gaze, you know, decolonizing media and all forms of knowledge systems. Because when Americans, and I don't mean this in, in any disrespectful term, when Americans or people from the West come to Nigeria to film, they are more eager to tell the stories of poverty, of degradation, uh, of want and deprivation and such stories and less eager to tell the positive stories that also emerge from the same Nigeria. And when uh, Sandy Chiofi's film got made and she took it abroad and showed it uh, to different places with all due respect to her and her work also, I don't know how many Nigerians got to see the film. I saw it because I had to buy it online and I had it sent to my address in the UK and then I brought it back home here to see and I showed it to many people. So those people whose lives you filmed, right? Those people whose livelihoods have been affected by um, this environmental disaster, which seems to and advance your own career because you've made this documentary, you've taken it to film festivals all over the world, people have seen it, you know, you become one more prestigious filmmaker, but what then happens to the people whose lives you've filmed? So are we going back to this extractive resource mentality where you go to this uh, local places in Nigeria or various other parts of Africa and you make films and tell people stories, but they don't get to see those things at all and they don't even know how you've represented them. So I think that that's something we also should problematize when we talk about the audiovisual forms of narrating these kinds of problematic or uh, disturbing um, stories. And to respond also to Jennifer's quarantine of the imagination, an expression which uh, I like very much. And, you know, I'm going to read a bit more about it to see all of the nuances of that a particular argument. I think that Ken Sarawiwa is um, like a central figure when it, and one who's representative of the Niger Delta struggles, right? Many Niger Delta people try to align themselves with his vision. And that's why his name is probably the most central when it comes to um, the oil politics and the kinds of activism against oil politics in Nigeria. Which is not to say that there aren't many others who have um, suffered a similar fate or whose lives also have been cut short because of their protests against this. There are indeed many. Um, but I'm just trying to advance some kind of defense in favor of the people who might want to think or talk about Kent Sarriwari alone. I think that they simply use him as a uh, you know, point of reference to so many other kinds of stories. But indeed, I do agree with you that there are many more um, faces to the stories that we need to think about and look at, and also that we need to be careful not to tell single stories, um, as uh, the famous Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie uh, has warned. Thank you. Those are really great points, Anuli. And actually, um, Jennifer has has picked up on some of that. Jennifer, you talk in your book about how literary and media culture are entangled with the accumulation of, of capital and carbon and how, you know, people acquire cultural capital. And indeed, 
I'm sitting, we, as you already pointed out, we're all looking at each other through computer screens in different locations and different time zones and maybe aren't sure where our electricity sources are coming from and who might be exposed to risk because of our consumption or who might, um, you know, the same may apply to, to producers of media culture um, as, uh, as, as Anuli has just said that, you know, sometimes the, the act of making a film or, or a program is, is itself bound up with capital accumulation and, uh, and the victims are not necessarily benefiting. Um, so how do we get past that kind of an impasse? You, you talk, Jennifer, about acts of, of reimagining um, and world imagining, reflexive world imagining as ways of maybe... Um, and, and even of listening and viewing as being part of an environmental praxis that might protect us from paralyzing guilt or cynicism or, you know, just pursuit of profit, let's say. Um, would you like to answer Anuli's points there and talk about those themes in your book? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me say that I, I, I'm pulled in, in two, I think, diametrically opposed ways, um, uh, you know, put, putting, um, Ida, your, your um, question together with uh, on, on all these points, because I think precisely um, because we're sitting on Zoom <laughs> right, right now, that we have the idea that images just circulate, um, you know, friction free and everybody has the same access to images. And so, you know, you're kind of putting your finger on, uh, you know, um, the, the, the ways in which um, this conversation is is um, is mediated by all kinds of things, <laughs> you know, like an energy. Um, but I also want to draw out that that this kind of like free floating global, you know, uh, I'm not going to say marketplace. Maybe I should um, of ideas is is really complicated. But by what Anuli is insisting upon that um, it is often the case that the subjects of documentary films never see the documentaries in which they appear. Um, and that is just something really powerful to keep in mind. And it's what I was trying to gesture toward with the thinking about Nollywood in the 90s as one kind of representation of Nigeria that's circulating mostly in Nigeria. And uh, this kind of um, the campaign, the international campaign uh, on behalf of Sarwiwa on the other. And just thinking about how those are intersect conversations that have everything to do with each other, but are not intersecting. And so, um, and, and so, I don't want to give in to uh, the the idea that um, the images circulate without friction and and with and are not determined by relations of power. And so, um, one thing that really drew me um, as I was thinking about documentary film in my book were scenes in the films themselves of the subjects of the films watching TV. Right or or looking at, at, at film, which I think uh, invites uh, viewers of documentaries to become self-conscious or reflexive of the act of their looking and to ask questions about from where are they looking and um, and who, who is not seeing this film. I think it, I think it's um, it, even in the age of the internet um, where we think that everything is available to everyone all the time. It's absolutely crucial to think about this. What what um, Anna Lee was gesturing toward as a kind of uh, economy of, of images that still operates. Um, and um, uh, so I, I just want to emphasize that that point and agree with it absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and culture, though, also, you know, one thing I'd like to to maybe talk about is there's also the issue of let's say compassion fatigue. It has is the word that Gillian Whitlock has used the phrase. Um, is there, we, we also need to have a, a, a kind of like joy or replenishment in making culture, don't we, in order to be able, because we, we've also used the word sustainability, you know, to be able to sustain um, the activist campaigns, to be able to sustain the, the struggle for the exoneration of the Ogoni Nine um, and to be able to sustain pressure on uh, on the Nigerian government to implement the cleanup that the UNEP recommended, but also um, to 
the, the, the pressure on governments in the West to um, to change laws, to be able to, to make co corporations more accountable, you know, and to make it easier for for victims to to take these cases and not have to pursue them to the courts for 20 years. So so um, so there's a there there needs to be I think there, there needs to be some kind of connection between kind of, um, you know, pleasure and joy and activism and, 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 and creative work as well. Would you agree? I, I agree. And I, I think again about uh, Zina Sarawiwa, who I, I think is uh, her work is, um, is, is, is wildly imaginative, but also um, in, in the strangest way, deeply joyful. Um, and uh, and it, I, I, I see it, or I understand her project, I think, to be uh, representing Ogoni not uh, only as a place of uh, suffering and um, and uh, toxicity, um, but also as a place where people are making livelihoods, as a place of of beauty. Um, and so, um, I, I I think she's the maybe the the best example of of um, what uh, Anna Lee was suggesting as as the need for a range of kinds of images uh, of, of things, and you know I, I will say that I'm I'm absolutely guilty of of, of this in my own kind of practice. Um, uh, the the photo essay book uh, Curse of the Black Gold, which I write about in the Disposition of Nature, has has been a really important text for me. I think it's a problematic text. But I find myself, um, even as I'm making these critiques, that when I talk about this book with my students, I tend to uh, highlight the photographs of violence, and uh, whether uh, by the state, um, by oil companies, or by insurgents, and uh, and I don't end up kind of looking at pictures of people living their lives, people going to church, um, people making food. Um, so um, yeah, um, I, I think it's a really important uh, idea. Great, great. Well, we have thank you all for these um, really excellent and stimulating questions and provocations. It's been a really wonderful hour. Um, we, it's, we're two minutes past the hour now, so we need to uh, log off. Um, did, did anybody want to say any final things before we log off? I do, and that is just to point you to David Pratton's work. He's a mm -hmm. professor at Oxford. He's researching the arts of oil mm -hmm. um, in the Niger Delta, and he's doing fascinating research around the representations of the Niger Delta and oil politics and conflict around the area. And, you know, it was through his work I realized again, it dawned on me, you know, quite uh, strongly that Nigerian musician Burner Boy, who's famous now for having won so many awards, Grammy Awards and so on, is actually from the area, uh, you know, so there's positive stories coming out and I would like that when people bring their cameras to film, you know, uh, oil spillage and all, that they actually recognize the good that's also coming out from from that region. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Anuli. Um, Barbara, did you have anything you wanted to say? Before I didn't know Barnaboy was from there. That's interesting. It was really interesting, lads. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to read more of your books, Jennifer and Anuli, have a look at more stuff. Um, yeah, I, I just, I found this really interesting. Thanks, Ida, and thanks, Anne. Yeah. Thank and thank you all. We, we really enjoyed the conversation. And as I said, we've just got lots of questions and provocations. I'm going to have to write the transcript out <laughs> so that I can <laughs> pick all of this apart. You've given us a lot to run with. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, have a good evening or day, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank care. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.